please be seated. Uh, before I lead in a word of prayer, uh, Carol, uh, nice to see you this morning. Uh, God bless you, and you're in our thoughts and prayers. Um, again, folks, I can't impress upon you uh, the privilege and the honor uh, for this time. Uh, the King of the Universe uh, bids each and every one of us to come. Uh, I want you to think about that. The King of the Universe encourages us to come before him during this time. That's an awesome thought. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. And we gather here today because we believe in the Holy Scriptures that are able to make one wise unto salvation. And we believe that there is a God in heaven who has witnessed to himself through the Scriptures and through the person of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit and the church of which we're a part. Uh, we, we bless you that we can be here today and call upon your name. We thank you that you bid each and every one of us to come. We thank you that your love um, for us uh, is incomprehensible. Uh, as David said, uh, my cup runs over, and your cup runs over with the love with which you have loved us. And we pray that we would try to comprehend uh, your love this morning. Uh, your goodness and your grace, your mercy uh, that is found in your only begotten Son. Uh, and we pray, Lord, uh, that as we gather today, uh, that our hearts would be settled, uh, anxiety would be removed, there would be a quietness upon our hearts, a stillness, Lord, so we could be blessed and uh, receive a word from you. Um, we pray that you would speak through the music, uh, the prayer time, the fellowship time, the message, uh, the reading of your word to our hearts, uh, that it might uh, be a blessing, that it might encourage us, that it might uh, bring a, a filling of the Spirit to our hearts. Uh, we uh, thank you, Lord, that if you were to mark iniquity, no one could stand, and yet we stand here today in the merits of Christ. We thank you for overlooking, uh, our, uh, covering our faults, not overlooking, but covering our faults through the blood of Christ, which is able to make the phallus clean. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, it has applied to our hearts. Uh, Father, we uh, lift up those in our congregation who are greatly struggling physically. Uh, Lord, you know the, the hurdles. Uh, those who are failing physically, uh, may you be close uh, to their hearts. May they sense your presence. Uh, may they have the presence of mind to have great, great joy to know that at your right hands are, are pleasures forevermore. Uh, Father, for those who are struggling spiritually or who are backslidden, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would meet them right where they're at uh, as the prodigal, that they would lift up their eyes to heaven, uh, confess their sin, and get right with you. Uh, also, Father, too, uh, for those of us who have cares about tomorrow, uh, may we understand that you're the God of the universe. Uh, you, all, you uphold all things by the power of your word, uh, all life and all breath, uh, the planetary system, the sun, the moon, the stars. Uh, you uphold everything. And yet we thank you uh, that we're able to personally know uh, the God of the universe through the Lord Jesus. So we, we gather here today, Lord, to that end. Uh, we pray that you would meet us where we're at and that our hearts would be richly blessed in, in sharing this time together. Uh, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in God's people said. Amen. Amen. This 
first victory from the New Testament in the Gospel of John. From the 14th chapter, the first six verses that are, I'm, I'm sure, familiar to many of you. God writes, and Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Also, believe in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. May the Lord add his blessing. One of the second scripture reading from the Old Testament, from the book of First Kings, the sixth chapter, we're reading the first thirty-seven verses. If you read the New Church Bible, that can be found on page three ten. In First Kings, the sixth chapter, the first thirty-seven verses. Now it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. As for the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 60 cubits and its width 20 cubits and its height 30 cubits. The porch in front of the nave of the house was 20 cubits in length, corresponding to the width of the house, and its depth along the front of the house was 10 cubits. Also, for the house, he made windows with artistic frames. Against the wall of the house, he built stories encompassing the walls of the house around both the nave and the inner sanctuary. Thus, he made side chambers all around. The lowest story was five cubits wide, the middle was six cubits wide, and the third was seven cubits wide. For on the outside, he made offsets in the wall of the house and all around in order that the beams would not be inserted in the walls of the house. The house, while it was being built, was built of stone prepared at the quarry, and there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron tool heard in the house while it was being built. The doorway for the lowest side chamber was on the right side of the house, and they would go up by winding stairs to the middle story and from the middle to the third. So he built the house and finished it, and he covered the house with beams and planks of cedar. He also built the stories against the whole house, each five cubits high, and they were fastened to the house with timbers of cedar. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and execute my ordinances and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will carry out my word with you, which I spoke to David, your father. I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. Then he built the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar. From the floor of the house to the ceiling, he overlaid the walls on the inside with wood and he overlaid the floors of the house with boards of cypress. He built 20 cubits on the rear part of the house 
with boards of cedar from the floor to the ceiling. He built them for it on the inside as an inner sanctuary, even as the most holy place. The house, that is the nave in front of the inner sanctuary, was 40 cubits long. There was cedar on the house within, carved in the shape of gourds and open flowers. All was cedar, there was no stone seen. Then he prepared an inner sanctuary within the house in order to place there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits in width, and 20 cubits in height, and he overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid the altar with cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across the front of the inner sanctuary, and he overlaid it with gold. He overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished. Also the whole altar, which was by the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. Also in the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood and each 10 cubits high. Five cubits was one wing of the cherub and five cubits the other wing of the cherub from the end of one wing to the end of the other wing were 10 cubits. The other cherub was 10 cubits. Both the cherubim were of the same measure and the same form. The height of one cherub was 10 cubits and so was the other cherub. He placed the cherubim in the middle of the inner house and the wings of the cherubim were spread out so that the wing of one was touching the other wall and the wing of the other cherub was touching the other wall. So their wings were touching each other in the center of the house. He also overlaid the cherubim with gold. Then he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved engravings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, inner and outer sanctuaries. He overlaid the floor of the house with gold, inner and outer sanctuaries. For the entrance of the inner sanctuary, he made the doors of olive wood, the lintel and five-sided doorposts. So he made two doors of olive wood and carved them on a carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, and overlaid them with gold. And he spread the gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. So also he made for the entrance of the nave four-sided doorposts of olive wood and two doors of cypress wood, the two leaves of the one door turned on pivots and the two leaves of the other door turned on pivots. He carved on it cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. He overlaid them with gold, evenly applied on the engraving work. He built the inner court with three rows of cut stone and a row of cedar beams. In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Zip. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good job, Dave. That was a long passage of scripture. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, open up these scriptures to our hearts as only you can do through the Holy Spirit, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, folks, so have you ever had a situation where you put too much food on your plate? Everybody's done it, right? Especially at the church suppers. You load it up and you think, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But it was all good, right? Well, I hope I'm not guilty this morning in loading up your plate uh, with this passage of Scripture, and I hope that I'm not biting off more than I can chew or more than you can chew. Uh, but my hope and heart's desire is to communicate the imagery behind the physical temple of Solomon and link that to the work of God in Christ. 
Uh, now, what happens is, and you probably know this, but when we go from the Old Testament to the New, we have this seismic shift from a physical temple to a spiritual temple. When we read the Gospels, Jesus went in and out of a physical temple. Yes, it's New Testament scripture, but it wasn't Solomon's temple. It was Herod's temple. But the work of God in Christ produces a spiritual temple that God is actually building because he builds his church. Now, let me give you a sense of how many people didn't understand what God was doing. In John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, Jesus said to his critics, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and yet you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he said this. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Also in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, Peter writes, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. So, one of the great truths of Scripture is, as we read it, we see that the physical reveals the spiritual. The birds of the air, the lilies of the valley, reveal spiritual truths. The physical temple points to a greater truth in Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 24, verse 44, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which were written about me, uh, all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So what Christ was saying is if you go into the Old Testament, you can see his life and his work. You can find him in the Old Testament scriptures. Now, a lot of people struggle to believe that the Word of God is the Word of God. And they don't understand Old Testament to New, and they don't understand the cultural nuances and all that. But this should validate the fact that Scripture is God's Word. We have Christ coming on the scene 2,000 years ago, and yet many of the Scriptures were written at least 400 years prior to Him coming. And we have hundreds of prophecies that spoke of his life and his work and his fulfillment. So this validates scripture. Now, what I want to do this morning is I'm going to make a feeble attempt to communicate that Solomon's temple, based on the pattern of the tabernacle, which was given in the book of Exodus, that its design and its layout all pointed to the work of Christ his great work, his life, and what he is actually doing in our hearts as I speak. Now, a, a word about the tabernacle. Uh, the pattern, the design, the layout was given from heaven by God to Moses. And Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 confirms that this was a heavenly pattern, a thing that was constructed based on what is in the heavenly realm. Things that we can't see, but has been made known to Moses and through the tabernacle design and layout. And the, the reason why I say that is because this is not a random design or a layout. It's redemptive. All the materials, all the metals, all the craftsmanship, all the colors, all the woven tapestry, the patterns, the artwork, the altar, the incenses, the sacrifice, the wash basin, the poles, the rings, 
Everything communicates a spiritual truth and points to the work of God in Christ. Now, when you read the scripture account here, Solomon's temple follows this pattern as well. The patterns are exact. It's not random, it's redemptive. Everything from start to finish was exactly as the tabernacle was. Everything followed to the T. All the T's crossed, all the I's dotted, right? Now, that being said, as you read this chapter, Solomon actually put some extra things in the temple edifice that did not alter the design or its work. Uh, the temple site was quite large, and therefore it allowed for, shall I say, some sort of architectural design and license. Now, uh, have you ever heard of poetic license? It, it's something that Hollywood does. But, you know, with, with poetic license in Hollywood, what they'll do is they'll take, they'll take a true story, and they'll make a movie after a true story, but what they do is a lot of times they change the ending. Uh, a lot of times they'll put things in there that are not truth, just to kind of jazz up the story. The problem is at the end of the movie, you don't know whether you have poetic license, you know, whether you, through the poetic license, you don't know whether you have truth or fiction, right? You don't know where the, the, the truth ends and the falsehood begins. Solomon never took license where he departed from the tabernacle pattern when he built the temple. Now, he followed the, the pattern revealed in heaven. Uh, you know that the tabernacle was mobile. You know, you have a cell phone, which is mobile. You have a landline, which is not mobile. The temple is a fixed structure. The tabernacle is, is mobile. But if you read... If you read here, for the grand size of it, Solomon actually doubled the size of the temple compared to the size of the tabernacle. But he kept the proper proportions. He also established an annex uh, or chambers that surrounded the temple. And these were storehouses, and I'll have more to say about this in a little bit. But they were never a part of the temple. He didn't alter the temple pattern. They were adjacent to the temple. He also added a front porch. Everybody loves a front porch, right? Called Solomon's portico. He put a porch on. But this too never encroached on the pattern. Now, take a look. Take a look at the structure of 1 Kings uh, verses 1 through 10. You have the outer design and layout. That's, this is all regarding the foundation and the walls and the roof. This is the outer structure. Verses 11 through 13, you actually have a word from God to Solomon about the condition of his heart. And then in verses 14 through 37, it deals with the inner layout and the design. When you get over to 1 Kings 7... It talks about the furnishings. All of the, we're not going there. All of these things point to the work of Christ. Now, when you read this chapter, it leaves you with the sense of grandeur and awe and splendor at what Solomon built. Uh, it, it was said years ago by some that Solomon's temple was the eighth wonder of the world. Now, it was a grand edifice. You can actually go online and you can see uh, some pictures um, uh, that portray the look. It was massive, built with massive white limestone blocks. The outer part was adorned with gold and parts of the temple. The doors were ornate and grand. No expense was spared. It was a chosen house and it was to to reveal the glory of God. When you go into the interior, it was exquisite. You have choice wood overlaid with gold. Gold was almost used everywhere. 
because gold is the metal for kings. Uh, King Midas would have been jealous, right? You have uh, interior rooms, the holy place, and the most holy place. With the most holy place, this is a place for God to reside in the visible form of a cloud. This was also the place where you had the outpouring of blood annually at the Day of Atonement. The Ark of the Covenant was in that place. This was the place of the mercy seat where the blood was poured for sacrifice. This was the day where the nation would know that their sins were forgiven. Then we come to the holy place. This was the daily entrance for the priest to perform their daily sacrificial duties. Uh, this place, uh, uh, their ministry, this place was separated by a very large curtain. It separated the two rooms. Uh, this was the place of the altar of incense that was synonymous with the prayers of God. So you get this sense that uh, this is an incredible layout. The temple was a beautiful place of wood carvings, gourds, palm trees, and flowers. A resting place for God in the midst of his people. It pointed to redemption. It pointed to sacrifice. It pointed to forgiveness. And it ultimately points to everything in the life of Christ and the work to be done in the believer. Now, take a look, take a look at verse 1. Uh, this actually is a verse that gives us a point of reference for the Exodus. Solomon's kingdom was divided in 931 B.C. This gives us an accurate point of reference. If you, Solomon reigned for 40 years, but the work began in the fourth year of Solomon. That means in four, 966 B.C., you add 480 years to that, and this is when the Exodus took place. Now, uh, just as an aside, you ought to know that modern archaeologists use a date that's a couple hundred years later, like as in around 1250 B.C. And the reason why you should know that is because when they, when they do the digging, they can never find any signs of the Exodus. It's kind of like the new narrative today when it comes to uh, redaction history and to show, it's almost as if to show that Israel was never in the land. All right? I just watched a video. You might want to write it down. It's called Patterns of Evidence, but it basically confirms that around 1446 B.C., you can target the Exodus. Now, why do I mention all this? Why is, does verse 1 mention that this was 480 years after the Exodus? It's because redemption is central to the life of the nation. You have a redemptive date, a time, an event, which the nation was redeemed. And much in the same way, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a redemptive date, a time, a place, when you make that decision, right? And Jesus Christ is foundational to that. So in that moment, when we make that decision for Christ, we become a living stone in the temple that God is building. Now, if you read the account here, notice that it never says anything about the foundation. The foundation is implied. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The foundation's already been laid. The foundation refers to, a foundation refers to stability, it refers to an established place. And this is also, the, this is the temple site. This is the threshing floor of Arana, or also known as uh, or, Ornan. And it has history. Uh, this is also the site of Mount Moriah where Abraham sacrificed, sought to sacrifice Isaac. So this is the perfect foundation that was laid. Uh, listen, listen to 2 Chronicles 3. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father, at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So the foundation is already laid. 
And, and you know that Jesus Christ is the spiritual foundation to your spiritual life in your heart. He's the cornerstone, is he not? You come over to the New Testament, in Ephesians 2, verses 20 and 22, the apostles and the prophets are a part of that foundation, but Christ is the chief cornerstone. And so the picture here is this. Every believer is another stone in the spiritual temple that God is building. And foundational to a firm foundation of redemption is the sacrifice of blood. You know that. Uh, Hebrews 9.24, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Romans 5.9, we are justified by his blood. This is the spiritual foundation, the blood of Christ. And as the songwriter says, what does the song write? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So the firm foundation, Solomon built on a firm foundation, Christ builds on a firm foundation. It's a sacrificial place, and it's all based on blood. Now, uh, as we move along here, uh, we have the uh, chambers or the annex that I referred to a little bit earlier. These were not a part of the temple, but I'm going to comment on them because I think that they have a, a significant message. Uh, this structure was a three-story structure on both sides of the, of the temple. These were rooms that were all connected by doorways and staircases. These were, these were rooms that were used by priests for sacrifice and storage. Uh, storehouses, they were storehouses for supplies used in the worship. Maybe perhaps even a resting place for the priests. And, and, and if you think about this, this structure is a picture of beautiful provision, divine provision for the priests, the, the priesthood of all believers. It's a rich storehouse of supply. It's a place of service, access and in interconnecting rooms, and a place for ministering priests. And it's kind of like, you know, you, you go over to our classrooms in, 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 this, in the Christian Ed building. Now the rooms are pretty much all interconnected. And Fellowship Hall, it's kind of like a place where you hang out, you know, uh, and there's a place of, you know, uh, fellowship and supplies and service and, you know, that kind of thing, right? That's, that's, that's kind of a, an informal place of ministry and fellowship. Take a look at verse 7. Solomon says, No iron tool was heard or found at the temple. All of the stones were cut at the quarry. Now, they want to debate like which, whether it was the quarry in Lebanon or the quarry in Jerusalem. More than likely, some came from both, but mostly came from Jerusalem. But this is, this is the picture here, folks. The, the whole picture is one of silence, reverence, respect, holiness. Uh, it's a sacred work being done in a sacred place. And it's a quiet work. You know, I, I was thinking of this. Isn't this the way God works in your heart? in my heart. It's quiet. It's reverential. Uh, it's holiness. Uh, you know, it, it, he doesn't hammer down and chisel away <laughs> in, in, the inner, in the innermost part of the heart. It, it's graceful. Uh, Jesus told his disciples he's gentle and humble of heart. He brings a quiet rest to the soul. All of the hammering, all of the jackhammering takes place in the quarries of life. It takes place, you know, maybe in the world, if you will. And God uses all that. All of the chiseling is perfectly done outside. And the stones are, are off-site and they're brought in to fit perfectly. That's, that's the work of God to the heart. Uh, take a look at verse 9. Uh, the work uh, was finished with a proper covering. God, uh, uh, Solomon put a roof on. And this is the picture. The foundation and the frame, the exterior work was finished. It's finished. Now, even though it's not finished because interior work still needs to be done, it's presented as a finished work. 
In verse 9, it says, so he built the house and finished it. And if you skip over to verse, verse 14, Solomon built the house and finished it. It's presented, the sense here is a finished work. And, and this is true of every saint. God is doing a finished work. He who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. You're a finished work. And yet, a lot of times, we don't see the way God sees. We see ourselves as chaotic and a mess. But we're a finished work. Uh, the foundation is laid. We're a part of the temple. He resides in our hearts. And the finishing touches up, finishing touches up, or touch-ups are, are taking place. That's the picture here. He's conforming us to the image of his son. That's the teaching of scripture. Now, what I want to do is I want to skip over verses 11 through 13 and come back to them. Uh, verses 14 through 37. And I'm, you know, there's, there's so much here, I don't even have time. But I'm going to uh, try to make reference to some things here. So, the interior work is the finishing work. And uh, the inner work here is, and listen to this, it's comprised of the very, very best materials. No, spent, no expense was spared. Preparation started under King David of collecting money, the site, pre preparing the site, but he wasn't allowed to build because he was a man of war, not a man of peace. Solomon, the chosen son, was to finish the work. <laughs> and it's the inner sanctuary, if you notice, that gets the, much of the attention. It's essentially a gold room. It's a place of sacrifice and blood offering, as I earlier said. Angelic beings span this, 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 the, the entire room, the wings, and represent the heavenly presence and throne room of God. Notice uh, the scripture said that all of the stone walls to construct the, uh, uh, the holy place and the most holy place, it was all covered in wood. And the picture here is that God removes the coldness and the stoniness of heart, and he lays it with wood and brings a warmth and a softness to the work. That's the picture. Uh, you have wood carvings of cherubim, flowers, palm trees on the walls and the doors. The flooring was inlaid with gold. Uh, did you notice the doorposts to, uh, were, were different? Into the ho most holy place was different. It had five sides versus four. I'm not even sure what that means, but it has a meaning. And so all of these things here have very, very special and pregnant meaning spiritually to the work of Christ, and what he ultimately does in the heart. And now, here's the thing. I don't see it all. You don't see it all. Scholars don't see it all. God sees it all. And, and, and as he reveals these things to us. But let, let me give you this. For example, the cedar wood. This is the finest wood in all of the land. The, the, the trees stood tall. They were magnificent. They were strong. They were said to be the supreme beauty and glory of Lebanon. You couldn't find a finer piece of wood. That's why it was used. You have olive wood and cedar woods. They had their unique representations too. Olive wood is synonymous with peace, prosperity, strength, beauty, luxury. It was the anointed tree providing oil. It was also synonymous with being a witness before God. The cypress wood was a fragrant wood. It was a lasting hardwood, but it was exquisite and exceptional for carving. It had a reddish color as well. The palm trees were represented, uh, represented with life and protection. They were fruitful and delicious to the taste. They speak of righteousness. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and every green 
to declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Uh, You come to the carved gourds and the pillars, they were symbolic of providing shade. Flowers, they speak of love, of flourishing glory and beauty. Uh, The two most um, represented flowers, the lily of the valley and the almond flower, and they both represent holiness. The gold speaks to royalty, I've mentioned that earlier, wealth and great value, purity and power, precious yet rare, indestructible, and yet it provides security. And when you take all of those intricacies and the materials and the meaning, it it all points to a greater meaning in the person of Christ. Who he is, the nature and the character of his person, what he offers, and what he is able to do in the redemption process. Uh, Everything uh, that these things represent are to be found in him. And if we are being conformed to the image of Christ, then they are to be found in us. The work of love, the work of peace, the work of righteousness, the work of holiness, glory, honor, strength, blessing, protection and shade, fruitful and fit for heaven, riches and royalty to every saint. That is the the vision that the Holy, the Holy Scriptures put forth for every believer in Christ. Now, uh, I didn't kind of mention this a little bit earlier, but let me, let me talk about this. The, the temple is facing east, and there's a reason for that. Because Christ is the bright and morning star, and he's coming out of the east and will come back to the temple. Also, what struck me was this. Did you notice that the steps up to the temple were from the south. That's how people came in to Solomon's temple. <laughs> I started to look at this. The south represents cosmic orientation, it, but it also re- represents a region hostile to life. <laughs> and it's associated with trouble and distress, a dry and weary land, especially in the Middle East, right? You know, when you go to the south, Uh, It's like brutal environment. Uh, Someone pointed out, yet Mount Mount Sinai rises out of the east to to provide some sort of hope uh, and and, uh, uh, a word from God that there's hope in the midst of trouble and distress in a dry and weary land. Beautiful, beautiful picture. So, uh, So these are some of the representations of people coming up the steps from the south. Now, we have an expression in our culture, right? When things go bad, what do you say? They go south. It's the same thing, the same idea. But this is just a beautiful, beautiful picture of people coming out of a dry and weary land into the temple of God. Um, and, And so we are the temple that Christ is building. It's a temple of glory and honor, riches and security, fragrance and a beauty of holiness. One of peace, prosperity, strength, love, and witness. Those are all the hand carvings of God upon our hearts. Now, you may not feel it, you may not think it, you may not see it, but that's what he's doing and that's what's taking place. Now, we come out of that south, to behold his arising in the east. One final thought here. Let's go back to verses 11 and 13. Because I I think it's really significant. This is a literary device. You know, there's a lot of different ways to write a paragraph. You can put your main thought in the beginning. You can put your main thought at the end. It's almost like there's a main thought here right in the middle. And you can do that too. And this is a word from God to Solomon, which is at the heart of the temple construction and work. And God basically said two things to Solomon. God was was concerned about the walk in the ways of God, and he was concerned about upholding the word of God. 
So essentially, obedience to the Word of God. Uh, the walk was more important than the work. That's, the walk is more important than the work, and I think that's what God was probably trying to tell Solomon. And that is true for us as well. Now, you probably know the end of the story with Solomon, right? Solomon's walk went south, and the nation went south, and the temple went south, and it was all destroyed in 586 B.C. All of this incredible work was ruined because Solomon stopped walking with God. Now, Solomon did come back to walk with God in his latter years, and you'll get that sense when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, a tremendous book. But here's the point. The kingdom of God suffered under Israel because Solomon went south. And that is true for us. When, when our walk goes south, the kingdom of God suffers like the nation. And so, as I close, uh, this is my closing word. We are a finished work in Jesus Christ, and we're called to learn to walk in him. Where, where Solomon failed, Jesus Christ succeeded. And so we're living stones, we're living witnesses. I've said this, etch-a-sketch, etch-a-sketch, right? The little thing that kids have. Every day is a new, a new day. And, you know, and it's a beautiful work. You blow it one day, you realize that Jesus made it all possible, and it's etch-a-sketch, and you get back on track. Now, this is a whole lot of food on the plate, but you know, these are the passages of the Word of God that are never even preached on. They're totally glossed over. Because you know why? People like, ugh. And yet, this, this, is so, this is so pregnant with spiritual meaning. We ought, we ought to read this and understand that the, mag, the magnitude and the mis, magn, magnificence of this work is way more of what's taking place in our hearts than what Solomon could ever do. All these earthly representations don't even, they pale in comparison to the work that God is doing in our life, in our heart, and it's a beautiful work. You know, last week, you know, I, I mentioned peas, right? Remember the peas and the mashed potatoes? I made shepherd's pie this past week. It's a great dish. You should have been invited. Uh, remember I talked about the guy spitting out peas? I hope I didn't give you any peas this morning. But this is just, the, to, me, to me, this just uh, uh, is an incredible picture of the blossoming work of Jesus Christ in the heart of the church. Uh, I'm blessed that I'm a part of it, and you're a part of it, and that should just blow your socks off. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that uh, every scripture is for our learning and there for a purpose and always points ultimately to the Lord Jesus. Whether we understand it or whether we see it, it, it it's all about him. It all point, points to him and his blessed work of redemption in the life and the heart of the saint in this um, uh, awful world, a, a horrid place, a dry place, a weary land. Uh, we, we bless you uh, that you bid us to come from the south up into the temple and to behold the work and the glory of our God and our Savior. I pray, Father, that uh, the vision uh, that we're given of Solomon's temple would uh, that we would have a vision of the work that you're doing in our heart and that we would understand that it far exceeds any earthly representation. Uh, we bless you for this time. We give you the praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.